Welcome to Antelope Park Church's online worship. Please read along with me to the call to worship. We come believing we are empty and will never have enough. We come fearful of sharing and losing our grip of security, fearful of touching and knowing the pain of others. We come overwhelmed by the hunger and the suffering of so many amidst this pandemic, both near and far, overwhelmed by the endless tales of senseless violence, greed, and injustice. We come aching from the weight of the responsibility, aching from the chilling challenge of knowing our abundance and the awareness that we have much to share. We come clinging to our meager lunches, bless them and us, break them and us, share them and us. Amen. Church of the Brethren. Today we're going to be talking about Hebrews 5, and we're going to read, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For anyone, for everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. When we were babies, we needed milk, right? In fact, we could only have milk or formula, for a little while, at least. But we wouldn't be able to get muscles or would not grow as much if we only drank milk, right? It doesn't have some of the other things we need to grow. So this scripture is telling us solid food is for the mature, for those grown up or mature in their faith, because solid food helps us get stronger. In verse 14 of the scripture that we just read, it says mature Christians are those who have been trained by practice to distinguish between good and evil. Talk about being mature in your faith. So how do we do this? By being together with Jesus, by continuing to learn about what he taught us. So today we're gonna to do a little experiment, a little example. There's some items here that, are, that represent people 
and the teachings of Jesus. This picture is full of vinegar, and it represents what uh, the teachings of Jesus can do to people. Each one of these glasses represent, is filled with something that represents the kind of person that may be a good example of how, sometime, how some people um, absorb the Word of God. So this first glass is filled with cream, and when we pour the vinegar in, you will see that it begins to curdle. There are clumps that are forming inside of this glass. And some people curdle like this when they hear the Word of God. They complain about how hard it is to follow God, and they never grow because they're so busy clumping. This particular glass is filled with baking soda. I'm a little nervous about this one. There might be, there might be too much baking soda in this one. We'll see. We're going to put the vinegar in and see what happens. This is like what some people, how they react when they first hear the Word of God. Oh! <laughs> they fizzle. You get lots and lots of fizz, but then things go flat because they lack the follow-through. Now this glass is filled with olive oil. It's not my best olive oil, but it's still a good olive oil, and I don't mind putting vinegar into it. So we're gonna pour the vinegar in, and I don't know if you can see this, but it's not really incorporating. The vinegar is completely separate from the olive oil. It's not together. And some people are like this. They never learn how to mix Jesus's words into their lives. They always keep it separate. So this last glass is filled with pure water. It smells like water, which means it doesn't smell like anything. This smells like vinegar. So when we pour the vinegar into the water, it still smells a little bit like vinegar, but you can't tell the difference at all. The vinegar has been incorporated into the water and it's become almost very, very distenuous. We, if we are like this too, we can be Christians who become so much like Jesus that people see him when they look at us. This is the type of Christian that I think many of us want to become. This might be considered maybe a mature Christian in some ways. So let's say a little prayer. Jesus, Help us to be the type of people who absorb your teachings into our lives so that we can become more like you. Amen. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We want so much to be back together in community, Lord, and we're thankful for this opportunity today to be with you in spirit, to be with each other in spirit, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us to open our hearts to your warnings and know they are done so out of love to protect us, to guide us. Help us heed these warnings and know your way forward for this body. We pray especially today for Wayne, Andrea, Olivia, Bud, and her siblings, Lord, for the loss of Susan Cup, Andrea's mom. Be with them as they grieve. Help us, Lord, to help be a presence for them. Help us this weekend with our various events, Lord. Help us next week as we delve into what to do with this church body opening up. Help protect us, Lord, from this virus. Help all of those dealing with it. Help our leaders, Lord. Help us to pray for them. Help us be more united as a people.
The scripture reading for today is found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. And the title is Warning Against Unbelief. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. As in my anger, I swore, they will not enter my rest. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Christ. If only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, who were they who heard and yet were rebellious? Was it not all those who left Egypt under the leadership of Moses? But with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. I begin today with two methods of open-air preaching used today using Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. It'll become clear in a few moments of my message why I'm doing this. First, the scripture from the NRSV translation. And let me just preface this, that immediately follows one of last week's scriptures regarding Jesus being a priest in the order of Melchizedek. It's titled, Warning Against Falling Away. About this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull in hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need to be someone to teach you against the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. It's the same passage Martha read for the children's story. Now, you may hear this passage read from a street preacher, or open-air preacher, as they're otherwise called, using the Whitfield technique, named after George Whitfield, the great evangelist of the first U.S. revival in America. Heed this warning. Do not fall away. So many have become dull in understanding. Do not be like them. You cannot just know the basics of Christianity. You need to practice your faith, continually seeking to know good from evil. By discernment, through prayer and devotional time, you need to be mature in your faith eating solid food, so to speak, not like babies only needing milk and to be bottle-fed, but to seek understanding, studying, praying, and asking God for wisdom daily. Seek righteousness, and do not be like the Hebrews who were immature in their faith. Another form of preaching using that same Hebrew 5's text may be done by a sketch artist, open-air preacher. I won't really be drawing, but imagine that I am. So the author of Hebrews is warning us to not be like spiritual babies, those unwilling to learn the basics of Christian doctrine. So we do not want to be like baby Christians who await their food in their crib and what they are waiting? Their bottle. When the author of Hebrews says it's just like the basics of Christian life, such as the Trinity, faith, baptism, 
But instead, we are urged by this scripture to become more mature. And how do babies grow? They get on solid food, meat and potatoes, spiritual veggies, like the advanced teachings of Christ, the Christian lifestyle, spiritual food, is the study of God's word. Living in peace with fellow Christians, trying to learn right from wrong by constant discernment, fellowship, prayer, and through scripture. We have to know the difference between false and true teachings. We do this through community and study, becoming healthy and strong. So there are just two different formats of open-air preaching used today. Did you know the Bible uses many types of this kind of preaching? done out in public to anyone who will listen. I've had a bad taste in my mouth about these kinds of preachers. I sometimes call them the bullhorn preachers. Have you ever seen one of them standing in a corner yelling into a bullhorn? I mean, really yelling. Usually the tone of their voice alone alienates me. Then if I can understand half of what they're saying, what I hear makes me cringe, and I worry that they're giving Christianity a bad rap, so to speak, rather than attracting people to the love of Christ. I've heard short sayings about, you're going to hell, you must repent. I have no problem with the repent part, but where is the Jesus loves you part? That's what I wonder. If people only hear of the wrath of God and are told they are sinful, why would they feel worthy to know what Jesus has to offer them? These are just the things I wonder. One day in front of the county courthouse in downtown Tampa, about 8 a.m., we heard one on a bullhorn. I could barely understand him, but I did hear him singing a gospel song, which is good. I would add praise and worship to the types. In my mind, this is the most effective open-air preaching that exists today. One time, our praise band in St. Pete played songs in a park at a festival, a Quaker festival. We also used to play outside our church during our annual yard sales. Another method I like is the United Beach Method, founded by Lance Piper, which uses a felt board asking different questions, drawing a crowd, and then they hear the gospel as it relates to those questions, and the gospel of John is handed out to those listening. I sort of like this method. I really like the relationship model, as this is what really walking with the others in their faith journey means and to one of the best ways to not only keep a good representation of Christianity with a message of love instead of hate or condemnation. One great talk I listened to was from Pastor John Piper on whether street evangelism was better than building relationships. He says that he does jogging evangelism where he goes into the town, prays for God, for God to show him someone he wants to give him, he wants him to give the good news. He stops when jogging, tells people his name and that he lives in the neighborhood, and asks how he can pray for them. He has a plan for sharing his faith that's five minutes or less, in case he feels led to do so. He does this by asking permission. He says, now I can tell you the best news in the whole world. He states that God made them for his glory, that it's impossible for us to love him like we should, but in his mercy, he sent Jesus in, his, in our place. 
that if we abandon our sin and trust in him, we will be forgiven. Now we can end there, or they talk more. Pastor John says there is not a formula for whether we should take urgent opportunities to tell near strangers about the good news of the gospel, or if we form a relationship first and ongoing, but says that both are needed. He says we must check our fear, though, and make sure if we're not fair, sharing within the first three opportunities of spending time with someone, then the gospel carries, does not carry the urgency it should. So we need to pray for more courage. We can ask for permission by saying, can we have lunch together and share our philosophies of life? Yet, if we only want to form relationships, we're not loving them like God wants us to. We need to be able to look them in the eye and say, I love you. I want you to be a fellow sister or brother who will join me in a Christian walk, in knowing Jesus and in heaven. He ends this talk by saying every morning we should get up and say, God, I don't want to see people through my eyes. I want to see them through your eyes. I just love this. So I know it's strange to hear about evangelism during the sermon, about warnings, about rebellion, right? But you see, this is a vital connection to what these passages mean today. For it's all in how we share such a message and how it might be taken. I would never start sharing about faith with these scriptures, but they can be a springboard for those who have heard the good news but not yet really committed following Jesus. Some believe this type of evangelism is too overt. And I admit I was somewhat in this camp, so maybe God is speaking me to th through this message. Yes, some have used this to spread extremist views or bad theology. Some have probably even turned people away from Christ by using this wrong. But that should give us all the more reason to want to do it right. We should reclaim this tried and true way of reaching unbelievers that has been used since biblical times. The cross is always going to be an affront to unbelievers, as stated by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 23. But we must remember that we have been saved in this way, that some have been saved this way that wouldn't step into a church. And you see, we cannot be worried about the offense brought by preaching the word of God. Paul says in Timothy 3.12 that opposition is inevitable if a Christian keeps sharing their faith. In some ways, we must encourage those who boldly communicate the faith in the public square and know that maybe in this time it is needed more than ever as people aren't coming to churches like they used to. Maybe rather than wait for the lost to come to us, we should go to them. These can also be warnings for self-proclaimed Christians inside and outside the church to make certain not just of our salvation, but that we are ready to receive the blessings of the word and that all that Jesus can help us with in our day-to-day -day lives. Like the warning from Hebrews 5 text I shared we must grow in our faith, not stay immature baby Christians. First, I want to turn back to a passage in Hebrews 2 that we skipped over in the first and second sermons on Hebrews. It's chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and is titled, Warning to Pay Attention. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape 
if we neglect so great a salvation. It was declared at first through the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him. While God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. This is a warning to pay attention to the teachings of Jesus, much like the vinegar in Martha's containers, that we must let them soak into our lives. They must become part of us, part of our lives, and should be able to be seen like the vinegar was smelled when mixed with it. This is not just about hearing, but regards us doing what we hear. You see, a Christian must walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Verse 1 says we would drift away. David Guzek says to think of a boat that's not anchored. It drifts slowly away. This is the same with our faith. The world will cause us to drift away from our faith if we don't anchor ourselves. Even if we don't have that rebellious attitude, we will because of Satan, the world, and all that is thrown at us. We have to work hard to be God's hand and feet around us and keep ourselves firm in the word. The ancient Greek word for drift away is like an arrow falling through a quiver or snow falling from a cliff. We don't have to do anything to drift away, see? So this is a little different than the section on rebellion we're about to get to. This is the forerunner of that, though. We must stay anchored, or the flesh, the world, the devil will have us slipping away without us realizing it. When verse 3 says, if we neglect so great a salvation, that's saying if we disregard the opportunities set before us, as I believe we are blessed to be a blessing. If we don't do the will of God, we will lose out on the real blessing, which comes from being a blessing to others. But this is more than receiving, per Guzik. It's not about us inheriting salvation per se, but it's about being rescued. We are being saved by God's amazing grace all the time from harm, consequences, and the mercy and gift offered to us through Jesus' death and resurrection. Lastly, on this portion of text, I want to draw your attention to the ending of verse 4. It says God does miracles and adds his testimony by giving the gifts of the Holy Spirit. See, God has gifted you so that you can contribute to make the world a better place, to help transform lives and be a presence for someone in need. Whoever you are, God has given you gifts. May you use them for God's glory and learn to discern the ways that God wants to use you. Now let us turn to what Martha read from Hebrews 3, chapter 7 to 19, when she read the scripture. What the author is referring to in the rebellion and hardness of hearts in the wilderness comes from the book of Numbers, the 40 years of wandering the Israelites went through. And it's believed over a million people died. So let's get, go back and picture what's happening here. God saved them by providing a ha- safe haven as they marked their doors and their firstborn sons, firstborn sons were spared, which we refer to as Passover, as recorded in Exodus. Then he provided a way out of the Exodus a way out of Egypt with the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. They saw God perform these miracles to save them. And yet, when they 
were out of food, they, then God provided them with manna. God told them they would enter a promised land, but they complained they wanted meat. And so God provided them with a multitude of quail. Scripture says miles were three feet high with quail. Easily killed, they spread it out, probably to dry it for preparing to eat. Then Moses sent 12 observers to check out the promised land, Canaan, one from each tribe. But only two came back with a positive attitude that they could surely go and take the land with God's help, Joshua and Caleb. Most believe the other 10 spies who said it would be impossible to take this land. Most believed the other 10 who said it would be impossible to take this land. So God sent a plague and many people died from eating those quail. This was a lesson to them and, and to us that what you think you want is not good for you. The Israelites named this place the grave of lust to remind them of what happened in their greed and their grumbling and against the Lord and his provisions and their lack of faith. They were demanding more than they needed, see? Boy, do we have some of this here in the U.S., right? We discussed in Bible study a couple weeks ago another story of when the Israelites kept complaining to Moses, also from the book of Numbers. And God sent snakes that bit many of them, and then they died. When they repented, God told Moses to make a serpent from bronze and put it on a stick so that those who looked upon it would not die after being bitten. This is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 14, that says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's what brought it up in our Bible study. And as you probably know, this passage is right before the main message of the whole gospel, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So God provided a way out for those that had rebelled in the wilderness. He did again so by sending Jesus to die on our behalf. And luckily, he does it over and over, despite our tendencies to rebel, to ignore warnings, as we tend to harden our hearts. So let us always remember to be grateful for what God gives us, what he provides, and to share our abundance with those less fortunate. Yet just as God always does, he conceded to the pleadings of Moses and provided a way out. As the future generations would thus, after 40 years of wandering, finally be able to enter the promised land. This was the rest here talked about in Hebrews, the rest from wandering. This research brought up something for me in today's news. The plight of immigrant mothers or parents today from Central America, trying desperately to save their children, wandering through their homeland all the way through another country, Mexico, desperately seeking to gain the status of asylum so they can start a new life here and save themselves and their families. Now, I'm not going to get into all the politics involved, and I am no way saying we should just have open borders or not do background checks. But we have to try to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, to have empathy and see God's will as Christians. If we were one of these parents trying to save our children, crossing borders out of sheer necessity, that's just a crazy, scary thought to me. How would we feel, especially if they then separated our children from us or put them into cages? I wonder if some feel God is trying to provide them a way out, an escape. 
And I wonder what Jesus would say in these situations. Anyhow, in this passage, the author of Hebrews is warning us not to harden our hearts. If we hear his voice, that beckons the question, how do we hear God's voice? Well, us brethren believe it's through God's word and in community with believers. This requires us to delve into studying the scriptures and discuss it with one another. Our Anabaptist roots tell us to learn in community, to be in community. And our Pietist roots tell us that we can hear God's voice in the quiet, in prayer, by listening to God. This week, I want you to listen for God's voice, not just about this message or immigrants or racism or the pandemic or politics or anything in today's world, but what is God saying to you about your faith? about your Christian walk, about his will for your life and the life of this church in serving. How can you serve this church, be in community? How can you show God you believe in his ability, not your own, to accomplish his will? I love the saying told to me in my licensing interview, God equips the called. He doesn't call the equipped. So, and I know that's true. So we must believe God will equip us if we offer our time, our talents to the church, to his will, and be his hands and feet in the community around us. Lastly, let us Turn back to the chapter 5 text. Baby Christians were also discussed in 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul says, And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready. He's discussing divisions in the church and the need for a common purpose. A spiritual baby is always dependent upon others, never learning independence or or growing, really. They're often amused by rubbish, by things that really don't matter. They put anything into their mouths or their minds. Feeding on anything often, even in the Church of Christ, prone to tantrums. Let us not confuse this with what Jesus says about coming to us as little children, though. That's about dependence on God instead of self. This is similar, but saying do not be dependent on others or this world to be spoon-fed knowledge from God, but be a participant, study, allow God to speak to you. And it's in verse 14, the mature are trained to distinguish good from evil. Notice it says trained. Well, how do we become trained in anything? Not by being passive, right? Have you ever seen a person trained without effort? It just isn't possible. If you're trained to be a doctor, you must study and work hard. A trained soldier must undergo much physical training and put forth much effort. It's the same with us knowing good from evil, I believe. We learn it from studying scripture, seeking to know God's will, And even through making mistakes, having tough discussions in Christian communities of faith. Let's face it, community is hard. We have differing opinions about how to do things, about finances, well, even about the color of the paint or the carpet. 
but we must find that common purpose more important, that seeking of God's will, even in the midst of disagreements, the taking of risk and taking on the next step and trusting that God is with us. For if we're not consistently trained, we will end up being deceived by our own desires and by the world. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, we'll become discontent and bored. We think we'll be happy when this happens or that happens, and then we get easily distracted or bored. And we're on to the next thing that will fulfill us, right? The lesson here is in knowing good from evil has everything to do, to do with realizing God only fills that hole inside of us, the one that's never satisfied except by doing God's will. See, to me, only our faith can provide true security. Only Christ can fill that God-shaped hole in us, even though we keep trying to fill it in many other ways. So we learned we must continue to find ways that God wishes to use us for his glory today, making the world a better place, sharing his love, finding our gifts and using them for the good of the church and for his glory. We must continue to grow in our maturity as Christians, not getting stuck in a phase of, it's good enough if I just believe, but growing continually, or the world and the flesh will surely make us go backward or trick us into rebellion of God, and therefore missing out on opportunities he wished. And lastly, we learn how even when we rebel, when we mess up, God is always there if we turn back to him. Jesus is there waiting for us to be moved by the Holy Spirit within, to submit and to allow his transformative love and power to work through us. Oh, abide in us, Lord. Help us in our unbelief, in our rebellious natures, and work through us for God's glory. May it be so.
Hear ye, hear ye, people of God. Take these warnings as saving you, not keeping you back, propelling you into maturity, into growing, and into receiving so that we can be blessed to be a blessing.